Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we continue our exploration about the extraterrestrial experience that humanity is embarking on as we enter our ET moment. And we're very privileged today to uh, have Reed Summers uh, with us, who's a, a writer and intellectual and speaker on these domains. Uh, and so, Reed, I'd like to uh, uh, have you join us. Uh, Reed uh, and Marshall will be back uh, in a couple of weeks uh, for a deeper dive, but we just wanted to open up for everybody's edification uh, the possibility of direct existential contact with extraterrestrials, whether or not you've ever seen one, whether or not you've ever seen a UFO or a retrieved craft or uh, alien bodies or anything that the military and the government uh, spend so much time accumulating and studying. This is another way to open up the dialogue. So, Reed, uh, I want to welcome you, and I uh, would like to have you just start, share a little bit about your background and what uh, uh, you folks are doing there as you build this body of work around the communications of the allies of humanity. Uh, and I know you have a, a PowerPoint, so uh, why don't you just make a presentation and then I'll circle back uh, when you're done. But thank you uh, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Great to be with, with, with you all and, uh, and to share some of this important information, which I think can shed new light on the overall uh, being, origin, and intent of the non-human intelligences that are in the world. And like you shared, um, my father, Marshall Vian Summers, has spent... The better part of, I would say, 40 years working on this issue and um, working in concert with a group of individuals he claims represent the allies of humanity, a group of off-planet observers, uh, neutral observers, who came to the vicinity of the Earth to observe the alien visitation to our world and report to us on its activities and to reveal what we otherwise may not be able to come to know without uh, an outside observer's perspective. Um, so that's Marshall. That's my father. Myself, uh, I've been working on this for many, many years now, um, but more on the sidelines um, up until maybe five years ago. Uh, I just left my career uh, in, in media broadcasting uh, out of some kind of budding sense to focus on this more fully and, and just feeling the gravity of the situation and how as people move into this space, it's critical that they think um, through a logical process, a framework to go from possibilities, to all the possibilities in the universe regarding who these beings are, why they're here, what they're doing, to uh, better probabilities, and then ultimately a starting assessment of this visitation. Because without an assessment, it's very difficult to formulate any sort of personal position. And without that, action, consensus, um, and, and response, which is, I think, what the human family most needs. So. Um, I am a writer and a speaker on this issue, and I'm working on a number of uh, documents, articles, white papers to help people through the cognitive process of making sense of this very confusing field of uh, visitation and contact with other forms of intelligence and beginning to come to a solid working conclusion regarding who these beings are and what their arrival in our world ultimately means. Because again, I, I view this as a massive uh, evolutionary threshold that we are passing over. It's more than an interest. It's more than an inquiry. And ufology has been stuck in this uh, paralysis by analysis for so many decades, basically asking iterations of the same question. And that question is, what is happening? What is happening? What is happening in our skies, in our oceans, in the government? And it's time now to move beyond that question to get to the latter, second, third, fourth order questions of what does it mean? How should we respond as, as a human species to this? Uh, but in order to do that, we have to have a correct and logical starting assessment of the visitation and use that to engage with new evidence, new information that's now coming to light, uh, thankfully, through the best efforts of with certain whistleblowers, people in the military, industrial complex, um, and with that, formulate a working conclusion that is adaptive to continued information, but is solid enough that we can basically say, 
We know what this visitation most likely is, and we are in a position to talk about responsible action to it. So that's my work, uh, is helping people kind of through this process of inquiry, um, going through the cognitive stages of it. And um, I'd like to actually uh, share a slide with you all. And um, this is essentially my process that I that I am advocating. And it has eight stages. And the first is where I would say the vast majority of people are on this issue. It's in possibilities. They're asking themselves, what's possible? And in a universe this large, it's it's a it's a totally valid place to be. I mean, we can't necessarily out of the out of the gate constrain what is possible in this universe, especially as it pertains to the phenomena that we see, which has these amazing capabilities. And uh, actually, I'd like to share um, another slide here. This is by uh, Lou Elizondo. These are his five observables. Just so we're 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 talking about the same phenomenon. Uh, I'm talking about the UAP UAP UFO phenomenon, and these five observables basically sum up the capabilities of these potential craft. This anti gravity lift, sudden and instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocities without signatures, low observability or cloaking, and transmedium travel. And so, back to possibilities. I think it's reasonable to say this could be many things. It could be anything. But I would assert that we actually can quite rapidly and with no further information or evidence than we currently have move from possibilities to probabilities. There are certain better, more logical, more likely and more responsible starting probabilities. And um, I, I think just simply by thinking through the full spectrum of possibilities, we arrive there. And I would like to talk about three variables of the phenomenon, um, and, uh, and and I think this is helpful to kind of start to bound these possible explanations to more probable explanations with which to start. Again, not to say we will conclude with them, or this is the final answer, and we know everything we need to know, because we clearly do not, um, but it's essential to have the right starting point. And I think, you know, this is just going beyond an inquiry or an interest that we may have in UFOs, UAP, this is a human species evolutionary event with massive consequence for our, for our survival and advancement in the future. And so I would say those who are in this arena um, should see themselves not just as readers and forever students of ufology, but actually as actors in this equation, like people with agency in helping shape the outcome for the world. And when you start to see yourself that way, it's a change of reference that makes you feel a little bit more responsible. Um, it makes your actions, your voice in this in this space more consequential. And, and I think it starts to bring into mind the sense of urgency. Like we actually have to come to understand this non-human intelligence, what they're doing and why. It actually is urgent. It's it's because it has <laughs> immense bearing ultimately across time uh, on on the shaping of many things in our world politically, socially, genetically, and we can get into that later. Um, so there's some urgency here, and so um, if I may go back to my slide here, let's talk about possibilities and probabilities, with the goal of potentially landing on a starting assessment. And again, my assertion is that we do not actually need more information than we currently have in order to make a starting assessment of the NHI. And, and I would propose these three variables of the NHI, their being, what they are, their origin, where they're from, and their intent, what their motivation is that has brought them to our world in the first place. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna unpack those three variables. So, Let's do that together. Um, what is most? What is the most probable explanation for the NHI being what they are? Um, I think there's a couple data points that, that immediately begin to kind of shape how we should see this. First off, let's go back to the phenomenon and the observables that I shared a minute ago. Um, these are physically observable realities. These craft are physical. I would actually advocate that they're more than objects or non-physical phenomena. I would say they are actually craft and that they are actually piloted by some intelligence. And I would also assert that that intelligence is not our own. And this is my own personal cognitive process that I've gone through to arrive at that assessment. Um, I would assert that these are 
like I said, craft that are piloted and not by us. And I think many people are coming to that same assessment. I would also like to uh, talk briefly about contactees and the reported stories that they have had in interaction with NHI. Um, a lot of these contactees are told, truthfully or not, uh, that these beings are from another planet, from another star system. Now, in the wide range of possible explanations for their being, which is that they're interdimensional, that they're angelic, demonic, that they're us from the future, that they're uh, ultra terrestrials that have been living in the world's vicinity, under the earth, for example, in the oceans, we would then have to kind of square that up with, with the preponderance of contactee reports and reported communications with NHI, which is that they say they're from other star systems and other planets. And so why would an angel lie and say they're an alien? Why would us from the future say that we are an, that they are an alien? Does that help us kind of in the ontological shock of encountering them? I would say absolutely not. It would actually increase that ontological shock. So um, we have physical craft with physical capabilities. We have numerous reports bearing a very consistent message that NHI are from other physical places in our greater universe. Um, and then we have the evidence that's emerging via whistleblowers and, and other uh, participants in, in the U.S. defense establishment, at least, saying that they have recovered crashed vehicles with biologics. So, okay, we can start to add up these data points and, and come to some sort of, again, starting assessment, not final conclusion, that um, these are physical beings. And that is my assessment. They're not us from the future. They're not aliens from here. Um, they're not angelic. They're not inherently interdimensional. There may be a multidimensional aspect to their technology, but um, I don't think there's good indication that they are not from our physical plane of existence. And so my starting assessment, this is a physical biology in, in visitation to our world. So that's being. The next is origin. Where are they from? Are they from here? Are they from however many light years away? Um, I think there's a couple interesting data points here I could share with you all. Um, you know, the craft themselves are capable of going at phenomenal speeds. I was reading a study this morning uh, about a certain inc incident with a UAP in which the, the researchers calculated its likely speed at 46,000 miles per hour. Now, the diameter of the Earth is 7,000 miles. And so why would an entity from here need craft that can transit space at that speed. Uh, in addition, beyond speed is acceleration. Um, you know, some of our most advanced aircraft can, can, can uh, handle 16 G-forces. Well, it's been shown that UAP can handle over 1,000 G-forces or even multiple thousands of G-forces. That degree of acceleration and energetic capability to move in space <laughs> Uh, to me, does not denote something that's from Earth, but rather something that came to the Earth and that is able to move around our planet at phenomenal speeds. Um, I would also say, in addition to the to speed and acceleration, there's there's the um, the varied appearance of these craft. Um, they seem to have shown up in our world following um, the First World War and most potently with the Second World War. And, and their presence has accelerated with the technological development of the human species, our degradation of the environment, and the um, development and use of nuclear weapons and, and overall human conflict. That seems to be kind of a concern of theirs. And that's also corroborated by a lot of contactee reports. Um, and so again, if something was from here, had been living on the earth for millions of years, um, why all? Why this sudden appearance in our skies, in our oceans, on land? Why this sudden interaction with the human species at an individual level, uh, representing the contact experiences that probably millions of people have had over the last eighty years? Again, it's it it has increased dramatically, like a hockey stick, with time, uh, and it seems to be at its peak moment, even possibly now. And so, again, my working assessment is that. Not only are these physical, biological beings, but they're not from here. They're not from the Earth. Um, and, and they are, in my view, most likely from beyond our solar system. 
Now let's move on to that third variable, intent. This is the tricky one. How do you know the intent of any other entity? For example, even another human being. That's, that's hard enough in family and business and, and the affairs that we have together. Um, and I think it is inherently tricky to, to decode intent. Um, but we have enough evidence on the table already across these 80 years, both of NHI presence and behavior on Earth, and the study of that behavior in the field of ufology and other ancillary fields. We have enough on the table, I believe, to begin to bound the broad set of possibilities, the anything and everything, into a more likely zone of probabilities. And I'm going to put this slide up on screen, which is a very basic first attempt, you could say, to, um, to lay out those possible explanations for alien intent. And, and then I'll talk about where I bound the probabilities. But on the far left, we have uh, the ultra-benevolent uh, hypothesis of salvation or assistance. And then moving over into the middle, more of a neutral or even transactional intent with our species. And then on the far right, something much more malevolent representing invasion or an intent to eliminate us as a species entirely. Um, now, there's a number of, uh, of very important data points that can, that can immediately help us begin to bound this. And one of them is that activity or behavior, I believe, denotes intent. What has NHI been doing? Well, let's talk about that. Secrecy from the very beginning. Non-disclosure across the last 80 years of their presence in the world. Um, interaction with governments, multiple governments, multiple layers or factions within government, which, is an in, which I believe is inherently divisive. There has not been an attempt to uh, disclose intent broadly to the world public, um, to gather or even foster some sort of global unified body that can interact with these beings. Uh, and it is becoming clear that deals have been made, technology has been transferred um, behind the public back in countries around the world. And these activities to me, this secrecy, this intent to do deal making, this intent to transact, is very indicative of, of the intent of the, uh, the alien visitation. Um, with that, I would also say once again that their arrival seems to be concurrent with certain trends in our world that are in the ascent right now. So the development and use of nuclear weapons, war and conflict, degradation of the environment, and the immense technological ability we have as a species to change and alter our planet, but also to alter ourselves to control our populations, to surveil them, to um, even alter ourselves genetically. These are very super recent developments in the technological history of the human species. And I think the arrival of a hyper-technological species at that time is no coincidence. Uh, and so I think we should begin to consider that. And then last, let's look at their behavior, the NHI behavior with people. And I'm specifically talking about the longstanding well-documented history of abductions, where people have been taken without consent, against their will, um, and things are done to them that clearly and very demonstrably violate their personal sovereignty. Activities and experimentation that in our human world, in our human courts of law, would instantly be considered assault, rape, murder, things like that. Okay, And before we cast that out and say, oh, that's our human projection on potentially a higher consciousness that, you know, has simply transcended our values and look at us, look at humanity, we're, we're, we're a young, warring world that can't get our act together. What, what, are, what do our values matter? I, I, I'm going to talk about that later, but this, this proclivity to abandon the human cause and sign on with some possible assumed higher consciousness and its cause is a very unwise direction to go as a respondent to the UAP issue. I believe we have to stay on humanity's side. Um, we have to be the human beings in this equation and think for ourselves, our interests, our need for survival, our need to maintain whatever unity we have left in the world, um, our need to maintain our self-sufficiency in the universe so that we have some sort of trajectory out into a larger cosmos in which we will not be influenced and tinkered with and made dependent on technologies from beyond. So think human, be human, advocate for what is human. 
And when this violation upon the personal sovereignty of individuals is taking place, and uh, there's a lot of good research that's been done on abductions, I think we have to like seriously open our eyes. And I'll go back to the slide, begin to bound these possibilities quickly. I do not believe the evidence bears out that this is a form of salvation. I also do not believe it is a form of elimination, pure elimination of the human species. Myself, as I move through this, this logical framework that, I've, that I'm presenting to you, I, I land on the transactional and the, and the integration as the most likely explanations for the intent of this visitation. And there's so much evidence that indicates that. And so going back to this image right here, um, I encourage people to begin to move off the possibility square. It's time. It's been many decades. We've been entertaining these possibilities for a long time. There are better probabilities that are more likely and more responsible for us to assume early. Now, of course, we adapt as we get more information. Um, and truly, anything may end up being possible, but not everything that is possible is the correct starting probability. And then I encourage folks to formulate their own starting assessment and um, get out there and say what that is. You know, so often I talk to folks and I ask them what they think about the visitation and I get just a blank, I don't know, or could be anything, could be this, could be that, could be this, could be that. And, and this hem-hawing on, on making any sort of assertion about this visitation uh, is a problem. And it's, and it's one of the reasons why this field has not been able to progress, I feel. And so more people taking that stand based on what is evidential, logical, probable, and responsible is really important. And I'd like to share a little bit more about this, this issue of responsibility, because I think that's a new one for a lot of people in this, in this arena. This has primarily been an interest um, for some, an adventure in consciousness, um, just basically a, a novel joyride into the unknown, into the enigmatic. And I, I think we like to stay on that joyride. We, we like to take, you know, multiple courses on the roller coaster. And it's kind of time to get off the roller coaster. I think, I think folks are starting to feel a little sick of that ride. Uh, and I think it's very possible to do so. And so um, this image is what I call the analysis. And it's the analysis of risk. And it's the analysis of threat. Because contact with another species with technological abilities vastly greater than our own does inherently have risk. Even if the intent is not negative, there's still risk. There's risk that we could get it wrong. There's risks that accidental... Uh, confrontation or, or conflict could arise. And then, of course, there is also the risk that the intent does represent a direct and willful threat against our species. And so, to me, this is the analysis that needs to be done. Let's talk about risk. Risk equals threat times vulnerability times consequence. Well, I'd like to vector in on that vulnerability word for a moment here, because um, I view our world as extraordinarily vulnerable at this moment. Again, the technological ability to alter life, even to alter ourselves, our psyche, our genetics, is right there in our possession. And we're like toddlers playing with fire at the moment. Um, our technological ability to hand over information to another intelligence, artificial intelligence, uh, to reverse direct our decision-making, inform our decision-making, a powerful tool with many, many positives, but in the hands of us at this moment, I'm not so sure. And with the other AI, alien intelligence, in a world at the time of artificial intelligence, I think the vulnerability is an exponential factor greater. And then consequence. What would the consequence be of an alien visitation that intends harm or that does not intend harm but simply has its own intent, its own agenda um, that has not been negotiated against our own? That, I think, is pretty big. And, you know, it's pretty clear that these craft and the beings that pilot them are doing so at will without our ability to properly track um, and, and permiss their access to the various systems of the Earth. Uh, if I may share this image as well, um, I think, you know, too often the UAP issue is framed as an aerospace event. Uh, and it's, it's not an aerospace event. It's a whole Earth system event. And even down, way below the troposphere, is the terrestrial surface of our world and its oceans. And 
these craft are very much in those spaces as well. Um, they're as intimately in our space as in the bedroom of, of an individual. I mean, that's, that's how close in they have come. And so this intent, whatever it is, has not been negotiated against our own. And I think the most apt analogy for us um, to use to consider this it is that of the intruder in one's house. We left the door unlocked or a member of our house unwittingly or willfully gave them access and there's somebody in our home. And before we start to question, well, is this really our home? Who are we to say who can come into our home? Uh, who are we to say what's even real? Maybe what's in our home is, is you know, paranormal to the extent that it's not physical when it shows physical abilities, right? Um, I think we need to start thinking like the homeowner in that analogy, and we need to confront the visitor and decode or at least demand what their intent be disclosed, and then negotiate that with our own intent uh, as the owner of this home. And, and that is not happening. We do have an intruder in our space, and we have for some decades, and what they're doing with whom, to what degree, is not sufficiently understood for us to, um, to fully comprehend the full nature of this visitation. But we do have enough to begin to understand it and to have at least a starting response from which we can interact, negotiate, and come to some sort of um, understanding regarding the rules of engagement in this interaction between human beings and non-human intelligence. So back to um, the starting assessment. This is really where I advocate people look next. And there are eight capabilities I feel we have to land on that assessment, to use evidence and iteration of that assessment to formulate an actual working conclusion. To be so bold as to say, I know who's in our world. I know what it represents, most likely. And I'm starting to think about what to do about it. That, I think, is the, is the cognitive phase in which we need to come pretty soon, uh, as many people as possible. And I think there are eight capabilities that can deliver us to that place. Don't have this on a slide, so I'll just um, read these. Uh, and th this gets into my work and what I'm developing at the moment and, and you know, the articles and, and white paper that I'm writing. Um, so more about this later. But these eight capabilities are evidence and not just hard evidence. I do believe the demand for hard evidence is a very soft argument. Um, I think this demand that it be physical, verifiable by eye, by hand, puts all the power back in the possession of those who've had it all along, which is the defense establishment uh, in the governments of our world, <laughs> outside the governments of our world, and the NHI themselves. And so I think evidence needs to lean on eyewitness testimony, the mass witness testimony of some of these sightings that have occurred the abductee experience, and the fact that people are corroborating almost identical stories of abduction across time, space, distance. These people have not met each other. Some of them have not been exposed to even to media regarding this. So evidence, I think, is one key capability. And the second is observation. I think we can observe UAP and their behavior more than we think. And um, I look forward to people delving into the observing capabilities we have, not just in terms of technological observing, but the human sensing of this presence in the world. Because we talk a lot about NHI, non-human intelligence. No one talks much about HI, human intelligence. We are the other intelligence in this equation. We have our own perceptive and communicative abilities that are untapped and often quite thoroughly denigrated as speculative or as, you know, testimony that can't be taken uh, for anything. And so I think that needs to change. Third is knowledge. We have knowledge of certain domains of nature and science that are relevant to this event of contact with other forms of, of life. And one of them is what we know about species interaction. And not just that of our own. There have been 4 billion species on planet Earth in the four billion years that it has been an environment for life, what do we know about how species interact, compete for environment, um, and then outcompete one another, diminish or go extinct? There are clear trends about how life works in natural ways. And I really do advocate people look at the universe first as a natural universe. Yes, I'm sure there are supernatural qualities to this universe. I don't doubt that. 
But again, to think responsibly in light of vulnerability, consequence, and possible threat, I think we need to consider the universe as one of nature and, and that this interaction is one of species interacting. And when species interact, it's often, sometimes, no, often for either environment or resource. And look at us. Look at the world we, we live in, this beautiful gem, this biological storehouse of possibilities that we are rapidly destroying and overpopulating. Um, I think there's indication that those visiting our world are absolutely here um, because of the environment, the resource, and the fact that we are eliminating those possibly forever or for a long period of time. And so this is species to species interaction. And we have knowledge about how that works, which we need to use. Number four is, uh, is logic. Whatever process we move through to come to a conclusion about the NHI, I think it needs to be logical. We can't just do a wild pitch out to some remote possibility that is desirable or uh, emotionally favored or religiously favored. Not to say that can't be possible. I do not think it belongs at the beginning of our logical progression through this phenomenon. And then number five, plausibility. I think whatever we assert regarding this visitation, it does need to be plausible. I could say, you know, these are space dolphins with the technology to, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And, but who would ever believe me? And isn't the whole point here that we can come to some sort of united human response to this event versus, you know, 7 billion shades of everyone's personal speculative desired opinion about it? I think we do need to come to consensus action ultimately. And plausibility is a really important part of that. Um, people respond to what is logical and plausible. And, and if our assessment of the NHI is neither of those two things, um, good luck fostering any sort of that united human response. Next, caution. And I'm going to go back to my chart here on the analysis. Um, I'm going to let you sum this out for yourself, but um, I sum out risk to be quite high. And that's because as we get into this deeper, um, the threat equation also sums out quite high. And so I think in light of this, it's just obvious. We should be cautious. We shouldn't be all bought in on the promises of peace, power, and technology by an alien visitor. We shouldn't also abandon our human interest in survival and in this world. I think these are illogical, implausible, and highly not cautious responses uh, to this event. And so um, we can talk more about risk and threat, and I hope we will, because um, the allies of humanity have something very important to give here that corroborates a lot of what we already are able to know um, on our own. And then last, uh, seven and eight in my eight capabilities is responsibility, which I've mentioned to the human species, and instinct. I think we have instinctual abilities as the indigenous sentience of planet Earth. And if we have an instinct regarding this visitation, I think that's to be taken into account. Um, obviously squared up against all these other capabilities and other you know, sources of evidence, um, but very important is the instinctual response in this, again, NHI to HI, intelligence interaction that we're in. Um, how am I doing, Jim, for time? Just fine. Keep going. Okay. Okay, great. Um, well, I'd like to move on a little bit um, to disclosure. Uh, I think we all know disclosure is rolling. It's very important. A lot of work is being uh, done to advocate government transparency and to bring the truth out to the, to the public about what government, military, contractors, private sector know about this visitation, what they have recovered in terms of crashed vehicle or biologics, as it's been said, um, and also what kind of deals have been made, what kind, of, what kind of interactions have occurred. So this is important. However, a few things. I advocate that we see disclosure as an event within a larger event. Disclosure exists within contact. And when you see it that way, it becomes less of this human, political, aggressive, you know, tar and feather experiment, um, a human controversy, and the controversy broadens to be the visitation itself. You know, back to the intruder analogy, if a member of your, of your household accidentally lets another 
person into the home, you don't focus on that member of your household and denigrate them and criticize them and blame them. First, you got to deal with the intruder. And we are not dealing with the intruder. And all the attention and anger, frustration is on human institutions, not upon the NHI. And I believe the NHI secrecy is what contributed to the birth of the human deep state secrecies uh, that we see today and that propels them very powerfully and gives them direction. And so until we turn, unless we turn on our own kind here, I think we need to, again, reframe this in a much broader picture as an event of contact, as species to species interaction with competitive forms of intelligent life. That's what's happening. I, that is my assessment, not to say it's not open to iteration or alteration, um, but that is my assessment. And that is, that is, you know, the place from which I push off in my work. Um, and I invite you to consider that may not be your assessment. That's fine. Uh, we all need to come to our own kind of cognitive uh, mile markers in this process. Um, but I view disclosure as an event within contact. I think very important is um, what is it that will be disclosed? <laughs> no one talks about that. We want disclosure. What's going to be disclosed? That's really important to understand. There's a huge difference between disclosure of something benign or malevolent, something minimal in nature or pervasive in nature something that relates just to this country, the United States, or to every country. And so this, again, is why there is some urgency for, for the UFO crowd community to come to a, a starting assessment of this visitation, because that's what's going to be disclosed. I mean, that's what we want, right? We want to understand the visitation, who they are, what they are, what they're doing, right? It's not just, do we really, really, really want to know what one defense contractor did in 1964 with, I mean, what? I mean, these we're, we're hoping that that yields or sheds light on the bigger matter. Um, but let's just think about that for a minute. The bigger matter of the NHI is not necessarily disclosable by the government. They may not know. They may only have an incomplete part of the picture. And ultimately, it's the NHI that has to disclose. And they've been unwilling to. So I advocate putting the controversy there. In addition, I advocate a few other shifts in perspective. And I'll put this up on screen here. I advocate a shift from an aerospace phenomenon to a whole earth systems phenomenon, a shift in perspective, a shift from seeing this as a U.S. centered event to an internationally centered event, a shift from a national security framing to a world security framing, a shift of controversy from government secrecy to NHI secrecy, and a shift from a military defense centered interaction with NHI to a broader interaction with the human species that is actually taking place. And so with this shift, I think we can begin to understand what it is that would be disclosed. We can start to talk about the goals of that disclosure uh, because as much as we want disclosure, disclosure could easily become the divider. Whereas I believe contact would be the unifier. And so to prevent disclosure from being the divider in terms of who did what, what they recovered, what they back engineered, the whole controversy, um, we should recenter that controversy as a planetary controversy in contact with non-human intelligence. That's what's really happened. And mistakes have been made. Crimes have been committed on the ground, human to human. And that's not, not important. But it's not the central controversy. And if, it's, if it remains the central controversy, as this is disclosed, it will be used as grist for the human mill of conflict and existing uh, opportunism, whether it be for technology, science, data, uh, who frames the international conversation. I mean, it's endless, the spirals of, of conflict that could arise out of disclosure. And that's why I think some of these shifts are really necessary. Um, I'd also, as I come to kind of a conclusion here, I'd like to bring back in what Jim introduced at the beginning, which is um, the possibility that communications have come into the world from other extraterrestrial observers that can corroborate what we can come to know about this visitation and provide information that fills in certain key gaps. And I think this is really important to consider because in our own human sphere, we, start, we, we tend to think that we, we are the only variable. It's human on human. We even start to think that the, that the, the visitation by non-human intelligence is a neutral variable in the equation. And many people do. Oh, they're just waiting to see what we do. They're, they're trying to help us, but they can't because of the, you know, the, the dark government and, and their secrecies. Um, 
the evidence does not bear that out. This is not a neutral variable. This is an incursion into our space with intent and with um, determined intent, actually. And, uh, and so let's put the NHI where they belong. Uh, they are most certainly a variable in this equation. And I think another variable that maybe no one tends to think of is other intelligences that do not intend to intrude into our space, but could actually help us understand the intrusion that's taking place by others who do intend to do that. And, and this is the possibility of off-planet whistleblowers, spies, neutral observers, governing bodies. There is the potential um, for some entity or group of entities to observe what's happening in, in this intrusion into the world and to help us understand it. And, you know, an example of that are the Allies of Humanity briefings, like you, you, like you mentioned, Jim, uh, that my father, Marshall Vian Summers, has received over a maybe 23-year period by now. Uh, actually, a little bit longer than that, about 27 years. So um, four sets of briefings have been received by this group of off-planet observers. And um, what, they, what they advocate is not that, they, that we join their trade federation or that we allow uh, them to access our world or that we sign on with their paradigm or their way of seeing things. What they're doing is amplifying our own set of strengths and Earth-based solutions to deal not only with our planetary problems, but also to confront this visitation, this aggressive, competitive form of life that has entered our human space. Uh, and and so that the ask is uh, is quite clean when you read the briefings and what they present as information that we would never be other otherwise be able to know is actually quite useful. They actually talk about the local environment of interacting forces in terms of trade and travel, politics um, that has propelled the current visitation into our world. So without understanding the environment of the visitors that would potentially shape their intent, we're really swinging blind. It's very difficult to nail it down. And so I think having some sense of the environment is actually quite critical. And I think it's actually pretty predictable that some entity or group of entities would try to tell us about that. You know, it's like, it's like the young person stepping out of the home for the first time out onto the neighborhood street. And they don't even, they don't even hardly even know what a house is, let alone a car or a bus or who that person standing on the corner might be. They have no clue about the environment. As I actually have a toddler who likes to leap out of the front door. He now uses the handle on his own. And he heads right to the street. I, I see him look around. He has no clue what he's, what he's perceiving. He does not know the meaning of it, of a car speeding down the street, of a dog off the leash. You know, And so I think yeah, we are kind of like that. We're like a toddler stepping out of our longstanding isolation, in the world, and we are being discovered, intruded upon actually. Our front door has been entered by other forms of life in this neighborhood in which we live. And I think it's, I mean, it makes total sense to me that at some point, someone would try to say, you know, look, hey, here's the, here's the neighborhood that you live in. Don't go there. Don't talk to that person. This person's okay to talk to, that kind of thing. Um, and so there is kind of that mentoring intent um, in the in the allies of humanity briefings and i think you know that's really important it's an important component of what brings us if i may go back to my my full framework here it really helps us get even from working conclusion to position imagine taking a position on all this well you have to feel pretty certain that you have the information needed and a lot of information has been withheld there's a lot of secrecy and a conspiracy and pollution of the space that makes it difficult to take a position. And so, you know, in the Allies' own words, it's really to help us do so that they are that they are revealing certain key things, key activities of the NHI visitation and also the local environment around us. Um, to foster, if I may move through my framework here, proposing action to take as a world and negotiating with others to come to some sort of human consensus which ultimately is going to be necessary if we're going to navigate this interaction. And then at the top, I have my eight outcomes. These, these are the goals for the whole thing that I hold out, which first being, let's disclose the NHI intent and agenda. Let's support a united human response to that. 
and let's ensure human survival and advancement as we proceed through this contact event. So with that, I'll turn the mic back over to Jim and we can uh, dialogue on, on some of the things I've shared. Thank you, Reed, very, very much. Uh, and uh, Reed is gonna join the after chat, everyone. So uh, we'll have plenty of opportunity to interact with him on this very, very fascinating uh, point that, that uh, you're making, Reed, that we have to see disclosure which is a human phenomenon between people who want to disclose and our governments who don't want to disclose. We tend to oh. think of that as the only thing that's happening. But what you right. and Marshall and the allies of humanity are saying is that disclosure is happening within the context of extraterrestrial intrusion on the planet with an agenda that because we're not aware of it, because we're so focused on disclosure, oh. <laughs> we're not preparing ourselves in the appropriate way to protect human sovereignty. That's right. And uh, I'd been reading through the uh, four volume Allies of Humanity uh, work that uh, Marshall uh, has has written, and it's very sobering. It's it's really uh, makes you stop and think of what is going on and how we really need to start connecting the data points as we move from everything is possible we don't know anything so nothing is known for sure so yeah. enough information coming out now that we can begin to move from possibility to probability exactly and that is i think this is where we're transitioning to and and the work that you've been doing and i might just say that uh, for everybody in the in our humanity rising community i've talked with a number of people deeply embedded in the u.s intelligence community uh who assert that what uh, uh marshall and reed are putting forward for us to consider uh is deeply uh important and aligns with what many who are what we would call inside the deep state have come to conclude about this phenomenon so this is one of the reasons why we wanted to uh have reed on today and and then reed and marshall back again in a in a couple of weeks time because it's it's part of disclosure uh, uh -huh. it, is 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 not only extracting from the government but thinking on our own now how yeah. we understand and protect human sovereignty when we have these advanced beings that are capable of doing everything that Lou Elizondo uh, uh, and mm -hmm. numerous others say that they can do they're clearly very advanced and the, the instrumentality which is what I'd like to focus in on the uh -huh. instrumentality of how they're presencing themselves. It's so subtle uh -huh. that we don't even know it's happening. And I'd love right. to, for you to unpack that, uh, uh, Reed, yeah. because I think that's the fascinating thing that I've learned from, from reading The Allies of Humanity is the subtlety with which the, uh, the takeovers, if, it, if you will, is taking place because we have this notion that when you uh -huh. take over there's this big army there's coercive force you know like right. when the Europeans came to North America and, and killed the Native Americans and brought in slaves and did all these things in a in a objectively observable way this isn't how it's happening at all and I'd I, I'd like for you to just take take some time and describe insofar as you know uh -huh. how the the extraterrestrial uh, beings that we're contending with, how they're working, what are they doing? Yeah, let's 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 dive in. I, I want to back up just briefly. I think it's fascinating that people in the defense establishment are 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 thinking the same as what the allies present and are in agreement with it. And I think that's simply a sign that the experiment is replicable. I mean, it's it's that 
you know, it's an objective phenomenon and there's multiple ways of gaining access um, to its data. And one of them is via an off-planet group of observers telling us what they see, what they have detected, and transmitting that into the world. And um, at, that, that that is meeting halfway with the findings of others, I think is really encouraging. Um, that said, let's, so let's let's yeah, let's let's dive into what the uh, the NHI are doing and the programmatic involvement they have in the world. Um, it's often said that well, if they wanted to take the world, they would have done it already. If they wanted to kill us or be aggressive or overtly destructive, they would have done that. And because they haven't, then it must be some form of beneficial visitation. It must be a different form of intent. Okay, this is where the thinking has to grow up. These, the, there are so many logical fallacies in that argument that has been made. I remember that argument being made against Marshall on stage at MUFON in 2006. Okay, we're talking like almost 20 years ago, um, as kind of like a dismissal of the even of the possibility of there even being risk, let alone threat. Uh, and so people go open arms into this visitation, thinking the best, hoping for the best. When I'm sorry, there is absolutely risk, and there is threat. And so let's 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 unpack these logical fallacies. Um, how would a hyperintelligence conduct conflict? Would they would they take and destroy? Would they bring an army to the to the, the shores of our world and start you know shelling the cities and the infrastructure of the planet? Is that what a hyperintelligence would do? Hmm. If they come from a long way away, let's let's just assume for a minute that. Um, it might be rather difficult to bring all the infrastructure needed here for such an invasion, okay? And so the force might be more small, more exploratory, um, technologically adept, psychologically ad adept, all of which they have demonstrated. And how could such a smaller force, you know, with supply lines that are quite long, far from their base of operations, actually conduct some sort of integration or colonization of our world? Um, well, in my view, uh, they would lengthen its duration. So don't don't try to do it in 10 years. How about 100 years? Not, there's not even a single human being that will perceive in their own adult life the duration of that program. And as we know, we have a very terrible sense of time horizon as human beings, like even planning beyond our, you know, beyond our own career, you know, for the needs of the next generation is challenging. So if you lengthen the, the duration of the involvement, um, it becomes harder for individuals to perceive the overall trajectory and its overall um, progression through the phases of its plan, and also to respond to it because you know their 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 the wavelength of their sound is so long that our little that our little plunk on the hull is like nothing. It, it's very difficult to penetrate the program of this alien presence um, if its duration is that long. I would also. If I were them, just thinking like they would, um, I would deepen its penetration into our human space. Don't just try to put out propaganda out on the surface, out on the billboards of life. No, alter us genetically. Alter us psychologically. Th this, this is how intelligence, hyperintelligence conducts takeover. It doesn't look like takeover. It's not what we would do. Um, but again, I think it's really important to, to start to think and, and this is my assessment, it's what the allies as well also, also say, is that the environment of this planet is more important than us, its species. They're ultimately really here for the planet, not for us. They need us, we're an important part of the planet, a life form upon the planet, but it's the rarity and value of this planet um, that has propelled these intelligences across time and space to get here. Um, that is the intent. That's what the allies say, and that's what I've, I've also come to, uh, to sense. And so if they want the environment, you don't destroy the environment. If you want the human infrastructure that's been built to mine this environment, to extract resources from it, then you don't destroy the infrastructure. <laughs> and if there's a workforce that can utilize the infrastructure for the exploitation of the environment, you also don't destroy the workforce. And so the visitation is not intent on destroying us. We're part of the asset in pursuit of the goal. Um, and the duration and depth of penetration is such that it's simply a different way of doing what we would do 
you know, but, you know, and to some degree, we do do this. Like, you know, corporations do go in to, you know, developing countries and create financial dependency, right? They give out loans and those loans are very hard to repay. Um, colonial powers in their attempt to subjugate native peoples have done so over uh, using an interbreeding program to breed out the locals, right? This has been done countless times in human space. Um, these are what I would call the strategies of intervention, that intervention from one species into the space of another operates along certain kind of principled lines. Only now they're way more principled, way more disciplined, way more nuanced and advanced. And therefore, you're right, Jim, they're very difficult to perceive. Um, but, you know, taken all told what the allies say, and I think, I think it's being corroborated um, by what is being understood today, is that this is species to species contact in the form of an intervention into human affairs with the goal of claiming some degree of ownership over the direction this planet is taking, the development of the human species, in order to gain access to what this world possesses. So to put it in a nutshell. In a nutshell. Mm, mm, thank you. Yeah. Now let's let's turn to how this information was delivered. It's, it's very interesting that this is not based on hard evidence uh, uh -huh. as such, uh, which is the focus of disclosure from the government, retrieved craft, you know, retrieved alien bodies, etc. Uh -huh. This is this is happening through the subtleties of direct contact and communication in the invisible realm. And I'd like to have you tell a little bit more of the background uh, of how Marshall uh, received this information so that people have a sense of another dimension of, of contact with extraterrestrials. Because what you're painting is a picture of, 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 uh, of uh, a subtle long-term strategy of takeover because of the asset of the planet of which we're a part, we're considered part of the asset. But then something else has broken through to uh -huh. Marshall uh, as a friendly warning. Um, and I wanted to just tease that out as as because yeah. we're just really yeah. wanting to get people thinking this is much more dimensional that we might realize. Right. And the allies of humanity are an example of that. So so tell us about the allies of humanity and how they came to yeah. identify Marshall and the, the reason, the release of this information. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, a little bit about Marshall first. Um, who, who's this Who's this guy who says he received such a communication? Why him? Why was he chosen? All valid questions. Um, Marshall has an interesting story, kind of an uncommon one. Um, he developed early in his career this certain telepathic ability and, and at first it was interfacing with other people, developmentally challenged people. He was a special educator. Uh, and, and he found himself able to interpret their unspoken, undemonstrated communication, unexpressed communication, um, psychologically, like, like mind to mind. And, and he developed this to pretty advanced level and it helped him in his work. And over the course of that, um, he began to sense into other minds. Minds that are not necessarily the one right in front of you, um, non-manifest, non-physical intelligence. And, and he would, at, at this moment, call this something of like an angelic presence, um, which ended up over time, he became comfortable with that. He felt it was reliable and safe because, of course, I don't think you can necessarily trust just anything out there in the ethers. Um, but this, this other mind began to guide him in his work and in his life. And through a pretty interesting set of events, a uh, pretty life-shattering set of events, in which this voice grew and basically um, began to speak through him and delivering a large set of communications, which continues even to this day, um, this telepathic link got stronger and stronger. And Marshall himself, as a, I guess you could say, a receiver of it, like there's a transmitter and a receiver, his ability to receive became greater and greater, more reliable, such that this voice could speak through him for hours and days. 
And there are cases when, when an entire book was spoken through him in four days. I'm talking hundreds of pages, spoken verbatim. And what you see published is what was spoken. And you look at that, and it's like, wow. <laughs> Even if somebody were to just kind of stream of consciousness consciously speak, I don't think they would speak that or be able to. No, but that's that's for you to decide. If you want to look at that book, it's called Greater Community Spirituality. It was spoken in four days, and it, and it's a comprehensive theology of contact. Um, so I highly recommend it. Um, so Marshall developed this this link with this angelic, non physical presence. And he developed himself as a receiver. And um, some years into this process, in, in 1997, actually 1996, he was asked by that presence to receive a set of off-planet communications, to which he was shocked and very resistant. Because Marshall was, was not a ufologist, much of a student of it. He was not even personally uh, much... Uh, personally interested in it. Um, and I think for many of us, there's kind of like this uh, this uh, uh, aversive relationship with the topic, like, oh, we know we're called into it, but part of it is like, I don't want to get into this. I really don't want to get into this. Like a love-hate or just kind of like that like that aversion. Um, and yet the, 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 the connection is strong. And I think many people experience this sense of innate, innate call, response, resistance. So Marshall did too. And um, he relented. And again, at this point, he, he was capable of receiving, you know, a 200-page book in one sitting, spoken through his voice um, in this, this very interesting state of telepathic receptivity and linkage to a verified source. So not just opening up to receive whoever and whatever, but actually building a relationship to the other side of the communication and, you know, Marshall can speak for his own experience, but, you know, he went through a long process of verifying its authenticity to his satisfaction. Uh, and so after that took place, he received in 96 and 97 this first set of briefings by this group of off-planet observers who represent um, a consortium of small but uh, sovereign worlds in our neighborhood of space who are deeply concerned about the visitation taking place on planet Earth, uh, especially in the, uh, you know, since the, since the last world conflict, World War. And so this group of entities uh, basically wants to see our world remain sovereign and not become a part of the larger uh, sphere of influence of those visiting our world, who they name the collectives. And the collectives are a, a body of competing, there's different ones, competing economic entities that are basically here for resource and environment. And this is what they do. It's what they do. They go around. They look for vulnerable worlds with, with, with assets. And they, um, they influence those worlds. Well, first, they study the native species deeply. And then um, they engage in genetic interbreeding. They engage in whole population influence, in psychologically shaping the behavior of the species, um, basically shaping its, its geopolitical balance and, and, and uh, state of being for their ends, and ultimately attempt to bring it into their collective as a very minor player, <laughs> as, as, a, uh, as a junior partner in a very big um, practice, so to speak. And so these, these beings who call themselves the allies of humanity uh, representing these sovereign worlds who have been able to maintain their freedom and stay out of those trade networks and those collectives basically saw that our world at this peak moment of technology, environmental destruction, division, overpopulation, was at a key turning point in which um, its vulnerabilities were, were maximal. Um, the signal that we were putting out as a planet to other observers, other predatory observers, you might say, uh, was very real. This is kind of like the, uh, the biosignature and the, the, the civilization fingerprint in our signature that we put out. And, and uh, that that has brought into our world certain, certain of these collectives. And so um, the Allies of Humanity gave that first set of briefings, and they gave three more sets. Let's see here, get my years right. One in 2008, uh, the second, and then the third in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, the second in 2001, so about four or five years later, 
the third in 2008, and then the last in 2016. And um, Marshall had very little contact with the allies in between. Uh, he was the receiver. I mean, he it wasn't a dialogue. I don't believe Marshall has ever engaged in live dialogue with the allies of humanity. He basically was requested to receive. He relinquished, you know, he put, put his qualms at the door and, and opened himself to do so, established this link with a specific source. And over time, um, let's see here. Oh, there we go. Almost hit my laptop. Um, and over time, received these four sets of briefings. Extraordinary. 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 It is a pretty extraordinary story. And, um, you know, I think it'll be great for you to have Marshall on and he can talk more about it. Um, as his son, I had kind of a privileged view of this process. Uh, and it was extraordinary. <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> Tell us just a bit, what was it like being his son as your father goes through these experiences? Did you mistrust it? Did you, uh, were you allowed in on it? Uh, you know, or were you sure, in, sure. in deep seclusion and you just sort of heard the the rumors on the other side? Oh, what, what, what was it yeah, like? Yeah, yeah, all... all all of the above. All of you the know, above. I, I had the, I had the full suite of experiences, which is like, wow. Um, <laughs> where's dad? Where's dad today? Oh, he's he's in his study, and you know, I go up to the door of his study, and I hear a voice, and it's not his, and it's speaking for hours and hours, and and that you know, I was like, wow, what's that? And you know, my mom gave me you know her best attempt at you know what to tell a kid. Um, uh, basically that Marshall is conversing with his teachers, you know, and it's oh, okay. His teachers, uh, interestingly, that's what the unseen presence called themselves to him. They called themselves the, the teachers, the teachers of the greater community, the greater community being the larger cosmos in which we live. Um, so, you know, I, I, I heard that of course I struggled with it. And of course I felt, you know, uh, different as a result, like most kids were not having this occur in their family. Um, Marshall was an extremely grounded, intellectual, sound person. And I, I think he developed that long before he, he ever got involved in receiving communication like this. And I think it was critical. I think if you're going to receive telepathic communication like that, you have to be an extremely grounded person. And you yes. have to have the minimum of, of personal stuff in the game. Like you can't be wanting it. You can't be after it. You can't be queuing up your mm -hmm. contacts to get to get the details exactly. your audience wants. You know, Marshall never did any of that. He he received what was given and put it out as such. And um, you know, he 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 got a lot of ridicule, a lot of pushback, especially as he tried to present this information. Uh, I think you know, at a time, all people wanted was a White House lawn landing and a radio transmission. And, you know, and or a manuscript with alien math equations that, that we could say, look, it's communication. <laughs> but, you know, I think what we're coming to understand yeah. is that the mind communicates beyond yes. auditory, sensory, visual means. Like there is a transmission exactly. of, of communication possible between consciousnesses. And, and this actually might be how aliens talk to each other over distance and in ways that can't be tracked technologically. How do you create a secure channel in space when your little signal is just flying forever and ever and can be picked up by anyone? It's possible that telepathy is a means of communication over, over space and time. And, you know, I, I, and I think people are starting to think about that a little bit more. And, and they're also starting to acknowledge the psychic uh, aspects to the phenomenon. And I think they're getting a little, a little uh, confused and misled by that, actually, in that there are psychic aspects to the phenomenon, but the phenomenon is not necessarily psychic in origin or in being. Okay, so people might have a visitation, an angelic experience, or um, a pre uh, kind of, uh, not a premonition, but like some sort of visitation, a uh, non-physical visitation, or... Um, they they might be kind of pursued, you know, this hitchhiker phenomenon being pursued psychologically after some sort of possible physical sighting. Yes, yes, these are the capabilities of intelligence that has developed itself beyond the purely physical three-dimensional biology in which it is housed. Uh, and so, 
you know, Marshall's had this journey of, of receiving this telepathic communication. Uh, it's, it's not been easy, you know, and I've, I myself have absolutely had to corroborate it against what is known, what can be seen, because I don't think, I don't think we can believe any alien communication, no matter how hard we want, if it is not, if it does not corroborate what we can ourselves as human beings perceive. The moment we abandon our perception and our observ observational capabilities, we're in trouble. <laughs> and, and, and if we start believing in something that defies those, and we, it's basically an A, B, pick one, us you know, or them. I think that's a dangerous scenario. Well, Reed, uh, thank you so much. This has been uh, very illuminating. I, I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, one final comment from me, everyone, is that this is the reason why uh, the New Paradigm Institute and Ubiquity University are developing our training programs. We need to know what the facts are, absolutely. And we also need to know who these beings are and how is it possible to communicate with them in an intelligible way. Because I think the basic message here is that in the end, as humanity enters its ET moment, human sovereignty is at stake. That disclosure is happening within the context of extraterrestrial presences on Earth in an intentional, permanent way with a subtlety of instrumentality that is so gossamer it's hard to discern, but that doesn't make it any less real. So that's that's why we wanted to have Reed uh, on today. And uh, Reed and Marshall will be part of our training program because we really want to get this information out as a public service uh, for all of our uh, humanity rising uh, global community to contemplate as we we take in the gravity of this moment. So, Reed, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. We'll have you back soon. And that'll do it for us for today, everyone. Uh, right. And uh, Reed will join everyone in the after chat. Thanks Good so much. See you all later. Yeah, Bye you're welcome. Now.